Broadcasting from the campus of Salisbury University, this is WSDL Ocean City, NPR News Talk 90.7. Putting Delmarva first. It's time for Delmarva Today with your host, Don Rush. It's probably the hottest issue for the eastern shore farmers and agriculture, as well as poultry growers. It's called the Phosphorus Management Tool, a proposal that was withdrawn at the last minute last year after the agriculture community rose up in arms against the new regulations. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. As the part of the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint, Maryland is required to cut its phosphorus pollution 48% by the year 2025. And one of the ways to do this is to reduce the amount of phosphorus supply to fields that have the highest risk of phosphorus runoff. Environmentalists say this is a key to cleaning up the bay, but farmers and poultry growers have argued that not only does it not reflect what they believe is the reality of the actual runoff problem, but that there are also key logistical and financial problems with the program. Take a look at this for the next hour. We have Kevin Anderson. He's a grain farmer from Princess and also president of the Maryland Grain Producers Association, and Drew Kozlov. He is a biologist and clean water advocate with the Midshore Riverkeeper Conservancy. Well, welcome to you both. Um, Kevin, uh, rather, uh, Drew, I want to start with you. And uh, give me a case for why this, why we, A, need, we need this program and why we move, need to move to this. And um, why is it that we're seeing, and it's in your view, such resistance? And we'll, we'll, we'll talk to Kevin in a moment. But why, why do you think it's such a, such a key um Program because I, as a matter of fact, I was talking to one farmer the other day who said, even by 2017, they didn't think that oh, this all this was going to be worked out. Right. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, I think to to really put this into a a small picture, first of all, you know, I th- I would like to point out the Tuckahoe River. It's a, a tri- tributary to the Chop Tank. Um, it's a river I've been fishing for 20 years. And 20 years ago, you could paddle that river, and, um, and it was spectacular. One of the most beautiful places on the eastern shore. And the fishing was amazing, and the water was clear. And um, just, I think, one or two years ago, I was out there in the spring trying to fish for white perch, and I could not take a single cast without getting my lure tangled up in green filamentous algae. And that algae is a direct response to phosphorus overloading in that, in that stream. And I, I've been doing water quality monitoring uh, all over the bay for about, um, about 15 years. And over that time, you know, it's just become more and more obvious that phosphorus, high phosphorus levels, are driving uh, poor water quality in our freshwater streams around the state. For years, um, poultry litter has been uh, applied on fields as a fertilizer, and and I think it is a, it's a very good fertilizer for our uh, crops, but the the problem is that it's been applied uh, based on the nitrogen needs of the plant. And what that's done is had led to a buildup of phosphorus in our soils. And over the last several years, we've learned that phosphorus doesn't just bind to the soil, that it mobilizes and dissolves in water. And in the monitoring I've done on in ditches on farms, I've seen extraordinarily high phosphorus levels in uh, dissolved phosphorus in water in ditches. So it's a, it's a real problem and I think ultimately we need to do you know we need to figure out how to go about um, dealing with this. I think the problem with uh, the rollout in the fall was that um, the new regulations basically imposed a lot of new strict changes to the way farmers do their business and it didn't offer any real clear answers for how they were going to achieve the new regulations and i think that's where the big problem was i think if you need if you're going to roll out 
something that requires someone to change the way they do business, you need to have the answers ahead of time. And you need to have thought it out and planned so that the state and, and uh, soil conservation districts are there to help the farmers meet the new regulations. And I think that's where the major shortfall was. Well, let me ask you this, because do you think that, that 217, and I think it was 2017 is the next sort of assessment where everybody's going to take a look and see, is, is this working? Do you think that's enough time? I mean, for this phase in, there's been one of the proposals, certainly, by, I think it was Maryland Farm Bureau, was to talk about a phase in. <clears throat> Although, as I indicated before, in talking to some farmers, they're not even sure, A, that you can make 17. And of course, there obviously there are some other issues. But just logistically, do you think that's possible? I, I think we have to, you know, if we're going to get to our, clean, our goals of the 48% reduction in, nit- in phosphorus levels, we have to start somewhere. And whether it's if it's an imperfect attempt, we have to get started. And, that you know, the first step is often the hardest to take in, in getting towards uh, any, any goal. But um, that's the one thing that my organization's been trying to do um, basically in all sectors that are involved in this cleanup is to show local jurisdictions and show farmers to, uh, um, you know, projects – we identify projects, we get funding for projects, and we put them in the ground, get the funding to put them in the ground, and um, to show all, all these constituents that, you know, it can be done, and you, you do it by just starting and putting projects in the ground that are going to make a difference in, in water quality. Just a reminder, of listeners, too, that, that that this is this this is actually a cycle in which you have you have manure which feeds the crops, the crops then feed the animals, the animals then produce the manure, and it's this sort of this cycle that we've used <clears throat> in the past. Kevin, I want to turn to you. What did you find as a problem with this uh, this rollout of the um, of the phosphorus management tool? And it, and is it just a matter of logistics, or is there something more fundamental as a problem? Well, when when the ag community looked into the uh, well, first thank you for having oh, me sure. today and good good morning. Um, when the ag community looked into the phosphorus management tool, we found that it affected all of agriculture, not just poultry litter. And the perception was that it was it was geared toward poultry operations and the spreading of high phosphorus poultry manure. But as we looked into, we learned that because of the practices that were sanctioned and encouraged by the University of Maryland for the last 50 years, that um, this affected all of agriculture um, because of the phosphorus levels that are in our soil. And, And I'll talk about that in a minute. And then as we went further from that, we started asking questions. Um, such as what is the environmental benefit of enacting this tool? Um, what is a cost analysis ratio to what it's going to cost us to the environmental uh, benefit? Then we uh, started looking at the logistics of it and how it would work out and started talking to the University of Maryland and the University of Maryland researcher um, explained to us that this was an agronomic tool that needed tweaking. It needed to be put in place. It needed to be utilized by the ag community, and then it needed to be evaluated. And the ag community was receptive to that idea until the Department, uh, Maryland Department of Agriculture, came up with turning it into a regulatory tool which came with fines and penalties and and all this even in the introduction stage of the of the plan and then we started doing our own financial assessment of the tool and and it was just astronomical let me ask you this uh 
Do you have any fundamental problems with the way they they assess the the, the the phosphorus in terms of its runoff? I mean, there's some there seems to be some dispute. I mean, the way this process works is basically they they identify fields that have the most phosphorus. They also try to identify fields that have the highest risk of phosphorus runoff, which are two actually two separate things. Do you and, and just in that part alone, as a particular as a farmer, do you have a problem with the science of that? That, that perhaps they're not doing it exactly right. Um. We have some questions that we haven't got answers to, and, and that's kind of the ag community's stance on this, is we need to buy into your program. If it's something that you want us as the ag community to implement on our farms, we need to ask questions. We need to be educated about it. We need to, to, to ask different scenarios of, of the people involved. And get answers, and and that was never a part of this process. Does soluble phosphorus exist? I will not dispute that soluble phosphorus exists. And if you go into an over enriched spot, and that has been over enriched with phosphorus, I believe you'll find it. Does that trans? Does that? environment there translate to all of Maryland agriculture farm fields? Maryland agriculture doesn't think so. Um, is there an issue with phosphorus in Maryland agriculture? There may be. Are there things Maryland agriculture can do um, to, to work with our environmental community to make it better? There may be. I honestly believe there are, but I don't think they come with fines, penalties, and mandates. Drew, what's wrong with the, the, the assessment, just the science assessment of this, that, that there's, Kevin has expressed some serious questions about, about whether or not the process, the assessment is actually accurate and is, is well, well based in order to go after and, and, and actually implement some kind of regulation. I mean, that, that, that's one of the key crux uh, of the arguments that's been taking place, just simply the science alone. Well, you know, I don't really know the details of what went on in this, the University of Maryland study uh, or you know, it's there's a there's a lot of variability as as um, we all know in soil type and in um, application rates and and water quality locally, but um, the the thing that I I mean the thing that really stands out to me is just that you drive around the shore in the winter time right now and almost any ditch that you look in has green algae growing in it. And in a freshwater system, that's being driven by phosphorus, excess phosphorus in the ditch. And and it, it's virtually everywhere. So just between that, you know, that kind of observation and uh, uh, years of, of water quality monitoring. I mean, I've, I've been doing water quality monitoring on the shore now for five years, um, taking literally hundreds and hundreds of samples um, tested them for for uh, total phosphorus and total nitrogen and you know we see uh, elevated levels of, of phosphorus both in farm ditches in freshwater streams in tidal streams like the Tuckahoe and the chop tank the further up the Tuckahoe River you go so that the most of the drainage is coming off of agricultural land, lands, the higher the level of phosphorus in that water. So it's really clear that we have to do something. And I, you know, I'm, I'm really, I wasn't involved in the policy. I support the effort to get some sort of new phosphorus tool in place to start doing something because we have to change what we've been doing. That's you know that's my bottom line is we we have to change the way we've been doing things but we also have to offer the ag community clear uh, a clear path to getting where we want them to go
and financial help to do that. Let, let me so make, let, let me make one observation. This is something that the Maryland Farm Bureau talks about too. Is that that originally many years ago they were applying something like 15 tons per per per, per acre per year. <clears throat> In 1996, the farmers had dropped it down to five tons per, per acre. Currently, as I understand, it, it's now down to like two or three tons per year. And and farmers will say, gee, you know, we've made all this progress, but clearly that they, if that's the case, certainly they've done that. But what you're saying is that even that reduction is just simply not enough. From what you're seeing, that, that, that even though they've they've done all this reduction, you go you drive around, and you see the effects of phosphorus. Well, what's happened is over the years, phosphorus binds to soil, and and so in a field over time, the places available where phosphorus can bind to that soil are fewer and fewer. And it doesn't go away because the the plants, the, the crops cannot use phosphorus as quickly as they use nitrogen. They don't need as much. So what happens is you, you build up the levels of phosphorus in the soil to the point where there's there aren't those places where it can bind in the soil. So then it mobilizes. And we've reached a point now where since we've been applying litter to, to uh, ag fields for so many years, that the phosphorus is mobilizing very readily, even with smaller amounts being applied to our fields. So uh, that's, uh, I think, what the science is showing us. Kevin? Well, one thing to, to, to understand this, as a, as a student in the mid-'80s at, in college, um, they encouraged us to to put our nutrients in they call it the soil bank my teacher my professor told me and and it was encouraged to put excess nutrients on phosphorus and potash uh, nutrients on in excess of what the crop needed to build up and enrich your soil and that was encouraged over the years so the ag community thought that we were building our soil bank so in a bad year or a tough year when we didn't have money to buy fertilizer because of a drought or a flood that our nutrients would be available in the soil to us so we were encouraged to do this practice and it was a sound it was it was encouraged by the university and everybody and it wasn't until maybe 2000 um 2001 that we stopped this process of building soil nutrients and started applying our nutrients on a crop removal rate. That is what we are practicing now. That never started till 2001. Now, there was a study that came out probably a month ago that said it, it would take 50 years for the benefits of what we did in 2001 to show up in our rivers and streams. That the, soil, the flow of phosphorus through the soil is so slow that it would take 40 to 50 years to see the benefits from what we've already done. And I think the Bay Foundation came out with that report that they that they're realizing that this mobilization and this flow of these nutrients is extremely a slow paced process so what we're seeing what he's seeing in his from the bay foundation's report what he's seeing in his rivers and streams today is coming from the over enrichment or the over application of crop removal needs that were practiced in the 60s, the 70s, and before. Let me ask you about one thing, because I want to see whether I understand this correctly. Um, that when the crops are um, given um, nitrogen in the form of chicken, chicken litter and manure, that it automatically comes with phosphorus. And one of the observations, and you certainly, Kevin, you can. Correct me if I'm wrong. One of the things, the observations, was that 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 more phosphorus tends to come along with the nitrogen than you actually need, even though the amount of nitrogen you have is what you need. If you know what I'm saying, so that it, it right. attaches. Is, right. is, that, is that a problem? And, and 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 if so, is there a way to fix that? What I mean, that was to, yeah. From from the mid 
When I graduated in 87, I've had nutrient management plans on my farm since I graduated college. From 87 to about 2000, our plans were a nitrogen-based plan, where our plan, we applied the manure for the nitrogen we needed for the crop. But in 2001, somewhere there, 2001, 2003, uh, my, my, my consultant that I hired to do my nutrient management plans changed from a nitrogen-based plan to a phosphorus-based plan. So since about 2003, I've been applying my chicken litter for my phosphorus crop removal needs and been having to buy commercial fertilizer nitrogen to supplement my poultry litter because we've cut our rates back from the five ton you talked about to the two to three ton. That five ton to the three ton was going from nitrogen based plan to a phosphorus based plan. And and the fifteen ton you're talking about, we refer to in the ag community was that was just uh, manure disposal. But also go back to what I talked about earlier this just doesn't show up where manure has been applied. Um, for instance, here in Wicomico County, there's people, there's, there was an area that planted a lot of sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes love phosphorus. They applied phosphorus to the, the land to grow the sweet potatoes. Only about 50% of your phosphorus gets you, that you apply in the old days got utilized by your plant. So the other 50% got locked up in the soil. So there are soils here in Wicomico County and on Delmarva that have never had poultry litter applied to them. But in a soil test will show you a high phosphorus soil rating. But when you plant a crop in those soils, they, have a, they show phosphorus deficiency and you have to, you, your crop suffers because lack of phosphorus. Your soil test says you have it, but it's locked up and unavailable to the plant. So the farmer has to go in and apply excess or, or, or more phosphorus to the land to grow his crop. And that's this, that's this whole scientific issue that we're dealing with in the ag community now about soil test phosphorus versus plant available phosphorus and and that goes back all to the science that we were talking about before about whether this is an agronomic tool or whether this tool is ready to be a regulatory um, tool with fines penalties and so forth it's drew I what about this idea that, that you have this phosphorus gets locked up and then, as he, as he points out, it, it moves slowly. I mean, so that it's really hard to tell what's going on. I mean, is it, I mean, are we gonna, it sounds as if we, we won't have to pay clean until, you'll be able to, to drive around and not see the algae until 50 years from now. I mean, what is, right. <laughs> what, what's, what's going on here? Well, the issue I think that, that, uh, I'm sorry, it's Kevin. Yep. yep. Is referring to is is the, the groundwater, right? So when water seeps through the the soil profile to our groundwater, it, the groundwater moves very slowly. And um, when you look at uh, the chop tank watershed, for example, I think it's between sixty and seventy percent of the nitrogen that's delivered to the river comes from the groundwater. So in that respect. The groundwater is is reflecting um, practices from the past, but what we see in the river, say we see big differences in water quality in a drought year, where you have less nu nutrients running off the land, you still have your groundwater inputs, but you don't have nutrients running off the land, and in those drought years, we see big improvements in water quality. We see a like clearer water, better dissolved oxygen, more subaquatic grasses. So what that's telling me is that 
that we're still seeing runoff, surface runoff of both phosphorus and nitrogen. And and it's that runoff off the land that's kind of tilting the the balance of the water quality in the rivers, in our rivers. So, yes, there's a there's certainly a discharge from uh, groundwater of, of both phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, but it's the practices that are happening on the ground today, on our land today, that really are, are driving our water quality. And um, like I said, I don't – for – for years, it's been a, a really antagonistic relationship between the environmental community and the ag community. And um, I really want to get away from that That because I feel like we're all in this together. We all want the same thing. And, and it's how we get there that is really the challenge. And that's why, you know, our organization has been um, working with farmers cooperatively bringing resources to the table, bringing money to the table, um, bringing new technologies to the state of Maryland that, you know, we just put in two practices that have never been built in Maryland before, and we're doing the water quality monitoring to try to get them approved as best management practices by the EPA and into the Maryland cost share program because we think that there will be effective tools at helping to reduce the um, nutrient levels leaving farms. Really, I believe that um, the way that we should go is is to have um, closer relationships between the ag community and the environmental community, to work cooperatively, to put projects in the ground that we think are going that's kind of reflect the best technology that we have right now, and then to monitor the water leaving the farm. It's cheap, and it doesn't lie. You take the water to the lab, you look at your results. Are we doing what we need to do or do we need to do more? It's all right there in that data. And you look at it together and you say, I think we can do better. Let's try something else. You know, uh, there's a lot of public money that's coming into play to help farmers put practices in the ground. And um, the whole cover crop program, for example, is paid for by the Bay Restoration Fund. It's something that the ag community rightfully takes a lot of credit for putting thousands and thousands of acres of cover crops down in the fall, but it's all paid for by that Bay Restoration Fund. That's water users, non-farmers, who are put, paying a tax to help farmers meet our clean water goals. And um, it, it's cooperation, and, and, and that's what we need more of. We need less finger-pointing. And more cooperation. Kevin, I want to turn to you. Uh, turn you yeah. okay, you can respond, but I just one of the things. What he seems to be setting up here about well, two things. One is that that he says, okay, well, look, we have sort of this experiment we can set up. We say drought years where you don't have a lot of <laughs> lot of runoff from the from the farms because it's a drought. That's kind of a control. Okay, so there's nothing coming from it. We can test what it what the water is like. And then in rainy years, when the water comes down. And washes and washes whatever it's going to wash into the. Now we see a difference. He seems to be saying, "Here's a little laboratory." And I guess what he's suggesting is, what we need is to sort of monitor these, the water runoff from the farms, to test out what's going on. But he seems to be saying, "This is this is we have actually a laboratory, experiment where we can see that current practices, not to pass, but current practices, do have a, this this major contributory to to phosphorus." What about that? Well, first I'd like to go back and say that sure. The, the cover crop program is a cooperative effort. It's not all paid for by the Bay Restoration Fund. It's a call share, and the Bay, Re- or Bay Restoration Fund um, contributes, but, they, but the farmer still has a significant expense of putting that practice on the ground. Um, so it is, it's cooperative in, in, in financially and uh, and. Uh, environmentally friendly mm-hmm. um so this 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 goes back to a problem that the ag community really has at this time um to go back to the phosphorus management tool when our when the researcher at the university of maryland josh mcgrath came with his proposal he really wanted to do a three-year two hundred thousand dollar study to come up 
to craft his nutri his uh, PMT, his phosphorus management tool. But be because of the political atmosphere in Annapolis, he was told he needed to do an eighth month, an eight month, eighty thousand dollar study. So the original PMT was was rushed, and the researcher had to go along with it. As the researcher implemented his PMT, it was rushed by the Department of Agriculture to get through to meet a deadline with the EPA when the tool wasn't ready. Um, Mr. Mag Josh McGrath um, has been making changes to his PMT or, or been evaluating changes to make to his PMT because he didn't have the initial time before it was introduced and and that has caused a lot of heartburn in the uh, community in MDA and University of Maryland so much so Josh McGrath has now announced that he's leaving University of Maryland on July 1st and going to the University of Kentucky. One interesting thing to carry this further so you understand where I'm going, mm -hmm. in Josh McGrath's department at the University of Maryland, he had three people, including himself. At the University of Kentucky in his department, he will have 50 people in his department. And the University of Maryland used to be an agriculture school. That's how it was started. Yeah, it's a land grant university. So the, the the funding priorities of the state have have really gutted the University of Maryland research. They have they have taken away the University of Maryland extension staff. An extension agent was the one that would take these practices that Drew's talking about that where they've been proven in other places and take them throughout the state and implement them on farms throughout the state. That network doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's been gutted to the point that it, it, it really doesn't exist anymore. So we have a need for research. We don't have the researchers. We have the need for education. We don't have the educators. We have the environmental group with, with practices that they want to see implemented on farmland to incre in, increase water quality. But there's no person to take it from his research that he's doing in the upper chop tank and disseminate it throughout the state. That's what we're missing. And we're missing we're missing the guy that's on the farm with the farmer to take the water sample and say, see, on this side of the farm, your water quality was X. And on the other side of the, where you did your practices, they were Y. And compare X and Y and see which one's better. None of that exists today. It's all, we think we know what's best. And if you don't agree with us, here's a fine and here's a penalty to go along with it. Drew, what about that? Lack of resources, maybe not quite. What, what, what's I your... think the lack of resources has <laughs> has been affecting the state and our water quality for for years. I mean, throughout my entire career, uh, you know, we've seen the Department of the Environment's regulatory staff shrinking, their enforcement staff shrinking. Um, probably in a, um, I would say the environment and water quality in general has taken the hardest hit throughout the budget cuts going back to Glenn Denning's year, time in office because, um, you know, you see a budget crunch and the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of the Environment generally take a larger share of the hit even though they're a fraction of the state budget. Natural Resources is maybe 1% of the state's budget. So it's, um, I think it's true. We need more resources. If we want to attack this problem, um, like, like Kevin said, there's no outreach to farmers going on the soil conservation districts. 
don't have the time or the staff to go out to a given farm and say, hey, we think this practice would work really well right here. And the the, the extension agents are just over overwhelmed as, as well. So that's kind of the role that I'm filling in the chop tank is, you know, working with farmers, looking at, first of all, trying to identify where <clears throat> we have the highest highest nutrient levels in our waterways and then moving up the watershed and trying to figure out where it's coming from and then trying to put practices in the ground on those particular farms to see if we can make a difference <coughs> excuse me <coughs> um so it's a uh, it's a big challenge i think for all of us for the ag community for the environmental community for any you know, for the soil conservation districts and for the um, extension agents. But I think if if we can move away from the finger pointing and the um, antagonistic relationships and start trying to work together cooperatively towards a goal that we all want, I think um, I think there's a there's a path and there's a way to do it. And and um, you know, jo I'm really disappointed to hear Josh McGrath's leaving Maryland. He's um, he's been developing some uh, phosphorus absorbing filters that we were we were planning to install this year on a couple of farms, and um, that's really disappointing. Um, it's, it's a sad it's sad for Maryland agriculture. It really is. I mean, in the beginning, I didn't uh, I wasn't a big fan of Josh, mm -hmm. but Josh earned my respect. Because because he he didn't tell you what you wanted to hear. He told you what the facts were. And and when you're dealing with people's livelihoods, people's mortgages, the way they feed and clothe their family, that's important. Um, and when the environmental community realizes that Maryland farmers are the army that they need to fight for water quality and that they need to not stand over us with badges and guns and come to us with a handshake, I think water quality in Maryland will improve. Well, let me, let, let me ask you, Drew. So, so you think that's been the environmentalist approach? I mean, th that's certainly the way, whether whether you think it is, that's certainly the impression that some farmers have. Well, well <clears throat> there, there's no doubt that um, there's been a lot of finger pointing on both sides. And... Um, I've, for years, you know, I, my mo mantra when I talk to people is if you want to see what a polluter looks like, look in the mirror. We're all polluters, you know, and <laughs> it really, it depends on the watershed. Like the, the makeup of where you live is going to kind of uh, drive where your pollution's coming from. In an urban setting like the Western Shore, like Annapolis or Baltimore or D.C., your pollution's going to come from your wastewater treatment plants, your stormwater runoff, um, and and those kinds of areas. Your land, the way your land's being used in that area. On the eastern shore, it's very, it's much more rural, and the dominant land use is agriculture. So that's where your pollution's coming from, and it's not a it's not a negative to the farmers. It's just a fact. That's the way we're using the land, and that's where our pollution's coming from. So, you know, it, I just believe that we all really need to uh, get off our high horse and, and, like Kevin said, shake hands and sit down and try to try to work things out and figure out how to move forward in a productive way. Because time, the clock's ticking, and you know, I've got a 17-month-old kid, a little boy, and. Um, I, w I want to be able to take him fishing on the Tuckahoe River in the spring to, like, be able to catch a white perch on every cast and and just ex have these same experiences that I, I've had. And right now, I don't think that's possible. I want to, I want to turn to, to the this, this solution. One of the one of the big issues that, that I, it seems to me that's, that came up is, okay, you're producing. Matter of fact, I ran across a, a statistic where there's something like 300 million broilers on the eastern shore. And there's five ounces of waste per day per bird. I mean, we're talking about a tremendous amount of output. Let's say nothing about about animals with with manure. So that's going to require, at, at a minimum, some kind of transportation and disposal of a lot of that. 
And one of the one of the complaints or the issues that 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 certainly the farm bureau's brought up is the idea that it may be virtually impossible to have that kind of of trucking. I mean, they were talking about what, uh, that, you know, be like 450,000 tons would have to be moved to the mid shore across the bridge. Uh, that's 18,000 trucks a day. I mean, we're talking, we're talking some, some heavy mm-hmm. duty numbers. So, uh, so, uh, Drew, I'll go to you. What about that transportation problem? Because it sounds like it's, it's a lot larger than what anybody is anticipating. Or do you think that those figures are correct? <clears throat> well, I think the figures are correct. You know, uh, Caroline County in the upper chop tank watershed produces 50 million broilers a year. And th- those broilers produce a lot of waste. I think the answer is not going to come from uh, transport. I think it's going to come from uh, new technologies, uh, bur- burning or converting that waste to energy, uh, composting the waste. So if you compost the manure, your nutrients are stable. The compost can be sold over the counter as fertilizer um, w- without any bacteria in it. So I, I think there's going to be some technologies that come into play over the next 10 years. So during this big cleanup effort, big push, that are going to help us, um, you know, give us some new tools to move forward. Uh, I think there's a, a process called pyrolysis, pyrolysis or that... Um, gasifies the uh the manure and i'm like i'm sorry i just don't know the technology but um i've heard i've heard some promising things about it i think right now it's uh it's not really practical on a large scale but on small scales it's um it's very efficient at at producing energy without uh, producing like say putting the waste into the air or you just create another problem um but uh, you know, again, te- I think we just have to s- we have to start somewhere <laughs> because the longer longer we drag our feet and don't do anything, the harder it becomes and the more expensive it becomes to address your your issues. And um, y- you know, I <laughs> we've been relying on modeling to to establish pollution limits to establish loads for particular counties and farms and modeling's good it gets you it gives you a general idea of what you need to do and um and where you're heading but at the bottom line is you need to you need to see numbers i'm a scientist and i, I want to see real data coming from local waters that shows me the trends where where we're heading whether we need to do more, whether we're doing enough, mm-hmm. and what's happening in our in our waterways, what's happening in the water leaving our f- local farms. I mean, they, they don't lie. Kevin, I, I want to turn to you about this, the whole transportation and disposal, for instance. I mean, as he indicated. I, I know, as a matter of fact, I was in Annapolis a few weeks ago, and I can't remember whether it was uh, the speaker or the president of uh, the Senate and, and um, House of Delegates was talking about the idea that, that one of the problems was that you needed some kind of incineration facility and that the state was just going to have to, you know, take it by the by the horns and say, okay, we're going to go ahead and do this. We're going to figure out a place to put it. The, just the practical stuff in terms of dealing with manure and dealing with chicken litter, is, is it possible to deal with all the the, the, the kind of manure and litter that's that's coming from the, these chicken houses and from the animals, or do we really have to ship it out? I mean, and is the technology going to be there? Do you think? I mean, you're you're in there. I mean, you got you're going to have to deal with this one way or the other, right? Right, and 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 I'm not a poultry grower. Right. I'm, a, I'm a grain farmer that utilizes poultry litter. the The ag community feels like that the alternative uses are going to be a large factor in in helping us with the problem or the perceived problem. The ag community also thinks that under best management practices, the best use of the litter is for fertilizer, for crop nutrients. But it needs to be done in an environmentally friendly way and 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 over application is not the answer but utilization in a proper manner here on delmarva 
is a much better solution than spending taxpayer dollars to transport the manure to an area that has uh, steeper slopes and greater amount of runoff. Uh, I mean, the ag can, I don't feel that 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 hauling a, a a load of poultry litter to Frederick County and dumping it on a hillside is an effective way to dispose of manure at a cost of the taxpayer of four or five hundred dollars a load Mm -hmm. and and versus the the proper utilization of it here on delmarva um i don't think we can send a hundred truckloads of manure across the bay bridge every day it's not feasibly possible um but but the alternative uses are going to be a key in in allowing the poultry industry to grow here on Delmarva. And that's what we have to look at. The poultry industry, ag in general, has to be able to grow or it becomes, becomes stagnant and dies. And, and we're at a point where we need an alternative use for poultry litter for the poultry industry to grow. Now, private industry is working on it. There are some very promising things on the doorstep, but also we still need to concentrate and we need to work with with university and environmentalists on how to utilize this stuff for the best use, which is crop nutrients in an environmentally friendly way. And, and, and the ag community thinks we have come a long way from the 15 ton per acre to the two to three ton per acre. And we feel like we're not getting a lot of pat on the back for that. <laughs> well, let, let me ask you, let me ask this. It, do you, in terms of the technology that you're aware of, you know, you talk to poultry yeah. farm, poultry growers, is there any, it, it, are there alternative ways or alternative um, methods to deal, dispose of this that would come online in a sufficient amount of way so that we could say meet say the 2025 deadline or the this 2017 assessment i mean how quickly i mean that's one of the one of the critiques is that you know it, the because the alternative as you say is okay well we'll ship you know we got all these eighteen thousand trucks going across yeah. the bay or whatever it, it, do you see technology any specific technology that that may be the answer to 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 this utilization well, there's a there's a couple plants they're talking about building one in uh, maybe Federalsburg. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're talking about doing something at ECI down in Westover. Um, there are some private companies that are talking about doing some on farm um, prototype stuff this spring. Um, there's a lot out there by private industry. On the utilization side, there's there's technology coming for injectors. There's um, technology coming that we can apply a chemical to the manure that inhibits this bonding to the soil particle which stops this buildup in the soil and makes it all plant available which w- would help us and, and that science is is coming and, and I believe five years from now the phosphorus picture related to poultry litter can look a whole lot different than it does today now another thing that people don't realize is the poultry litter that my farm received from a poultry grower five years ago the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus was probably um, two times phosphorus to one part nitrogen now it's a lot closer to one to one because of of the steps that the integrators have taken to try to be more environmentally friendly with their feed additives so so the farmer has the farmer has reduced the amount he's applying the integrators the poultry companies have reduced the amount of phosphorus that's in the manure that he's applying so now we need to concentrate on the effective ways to use it the most environmentally friendly way. The one thing I want to touch on before we get done was 
the the outrage about the ag community over the PMT was not only because you were changing our way of life, um, it was financially, and and the PMT had a big financial burden on on farmers that have loans and mortgages. They have business plans and business models that they're following. And on my farm, for instance, um, if we went straight across the board and implemented the, the PMT and took, and I spread no more poultry manure on my farm, that would cost me about $150,000 a year. And I can tell you there's a lot of years I don't make $150,000. So it affected people's livelihoods and their ability to make their payments. And that induced fear into the community. We kept asking for an environmental impact study from the Department of Agriculture they resisted they they wanted no parts of it you talk about an economic um an economic, economic impact yeah, study okay, yeah um we have asked our legislators senator matthias and and um representative conway have introduced bills in annapolis that will will see if DBED, department of business and economic development will do an economic impact study on the phosphorus management tool so then the ag community can sit down with the environmental community and we can weigh our environmental benefits against our economic cost because we do that in everyday life with everything else i mean we could build a car today that you could take an 80 mile an hour head-on collision and get up and walk away but the general public couldn't afford to buy the car so we weigh safety versus the need for the individual to buy a car. And that's this, we need, I'm not saying that we, it's all financially dependent, but we need to be have, we need to have the eye on that and pay attention that a vibrant ag community is the key to cleaning up the bay. And, and and that seems to be missing in this whole deal. Drew, what about what about the cost? Matter of fact, I was talking to the, the secretary, uh, Buddy Hans, and he indicated there's some kind of economic stuff or look at at what at what was going on was was actually in in, in progress. Now that we mm-hmm. do have this legislation, there's a there's sort of a formal thing, I guess, that's going on as well with some of the. The local folks. So what about this financial? I mean, one of the and people when they talk to me about about the particular <clears throat> chicken industry, they will hear this all the time. So like, you know, the chicken industry like a hundred years ago, no, they, we didn't see this as an issue. We didn't see this as a problem. Well, as we go along, we we clearly say, well, we have these problems with the bay, mm-hmm. and that will require particularly poultry growers and farmers as well, but poultry growers to take on added costs because of where they're located as opposed to say someone else right so the question becomes if we want the poultry industry to stay on delmarva as a state then it seems to me that we have to deal with the social costs which is pollution and and the question becomes how do we continue to make our agriculture or poultry segment um competitive on the one hand while still dealing with the financial drag mm-hmm. that, that we have in terms of, of the, the bay. I mean, it seems to me that's the sort of the social trade-off costs that, 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 that you got there. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, that's a um, huge question. I think someone could write a PhD <laughs> on, uh, on that. Kevin but, will do it. <laughs> but, um, you know, to, to Kevin's point, I, I, I'm in a complete agreement that um, a vibrant ag community is, is critical to uh, cleaning up the bay. I think that, um, you know, the, the quality of life on the eastern shore is really linked um, linked to agriculture and um, really closely. And, and um, it's why people love, love the shore so much. 
What about the cost? I mean, well, I mean, I mean, the cost, as, as, as the a cost taxpayer, should, should are we not. willing to? As a taxpayer, should we willing to do this? I mean, I, I remember. As a matter of fact, I remember asking the, the governor the other a few weeks ago directly about this, and and when it talking about economic studies and the cost, the cost benefit, and he says, well, you know, down the road, if we don't do anything, what's the cost of the, to the pollution to the to to the well here? Base? So he didn't seem to be very sympathetic, but I here's a a, a interesting dynamic. There, there are a couple of large companies that are profiting tremendously in this industry. The Purdue's, the Mount Airs, mm-hmm. the Allen Harims. I mean, they're, they're making a lot of money. Purdue is a $4 billion company. And the way they write their contracts right now, the family farmer, the growers, are responsible for dealing with the litter. And I would like to see the integrators putting more money into research, into helping us find a solution to this problem. They've been pretty quiet. Um, I think in the this PMT discussion, and and I would like to see them r- reach out a hand and say, "Hey, we're in this too. We want to be a part of the solution. We want to continue." to have a profitable business, but we realize that we also have to take responsibility for the amount of manure being produced and and help find a solution that works for everybody. It shouldn't be placed on just the taxpayer, right? We all have been paying the cost of, of pollution by losing, uh, losing fisheries, losing water quality, um, and it's something that it, it, to the, at this point, is starting to affect public health in in certain waterways. The Transquaking River outside of Cambridge is being shut down every summer from algae blooms um, the, of this toxic blue green algae. There's a Girl Scout camp outside of Denton that ha, is on a lake, and they can't even touch the water because of these algae blooms that are happening. And it's <laughs> the entire watershed above that above that girl scout camp is uh really all about the poultry industry and i'm not yeah I'm, well let, let me ask you, kevin <clears throat> what about he, he basically saying and, and i know there's this great debate about about how much responsibility say a purdue or a mother whatever has and vis-a-vis it's 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 growers and that's one of the things that was that there was there were, i know that will be more attempts to to adjudicate that but I mean, um, what I'm hearing is that, you know, that some of these companies say, gee, you know, if we have too many more regulations, if we have, you know, too uh, too, mo- too much uh, financial burden added to us that, gee, we, we may leave or we may do something else. Is it from your from what you talk to, particularly in the poultry industry, is the money there? I mean, is it can they contribute more? What's I mean, because that's what they, that's one of the things that the environmentalists obviously are arguing. Well. Purdue Farms has made a substantial investment in dealing with this issue through their agro recycle project in mm-hmm. in Seaford, Delaware, and in in you know I've heard that that's cost them forty to fifty million dollars in the red for the ten or twelve years that it's been there. So so Purdue Farms sees it as an issue and they're working toward it. Now whether the other integrators catch the same spirit or not uh i'm not in i'm not that's above my pay grade (laughs) um the one thing that i would like to to bring out before we leave here today is that there's a lot of good things happening in the bay that don't get don't get broadcast and, and they're not written up in the paper the tangier sound is blooming with oysters Oysters are abundant in the Tangier Sound now, and in the last two or three years, we've had pretty good, pretty good uh, seafood industry in the Tangier Sound, which is the basin for the drainage of a lot of this land that manure is being applied to, um, and and nobody's talking about the revitalization of the Tangier Sound, and and. There's some good things happening there, and I think that they need to be publicized also. 
Okay. Uh, we've been talking to Kevin Anderson. He's a grain farmer, also from Princess Anne, and president of the Maryland Grain Producers Association. Also with us is Drew Cosall. He is a biologist and clean water advocate with the Midshore Riverkeeper Conservancy. And we've been talking about the new phosphorus management tool, which uh, is still in process of being evaluated. No doubt we will probably hear more about this. And I know the legislators are in there trying to get an economic um, impact study done, and we'll probably all get together in 2017 and figure out whether it all worked. You've been listening to Delmarva Today. I'm Don Rush. Thanks for listening. This has been Delmarva Today, a production of Delmarva Public Radio. Chris Rank produces and is our audio engineer. Our volunteer producers are Penny Hartman, Kathleen Grout, and Jim White. Don Rush is your host. For podcasts, visit our website, delmarvapublicradio.net, or subscribe to the Delmarva Today podcast in iTunes. Delmarva Today can now be seen on PAC 14. To view the schedule, visit the Daily Times or visit pac14.org. Mm-hmm.